Hello chaps and chapesses. This week I want to tell you about Estancia Maria Bajete in Argentina. I returned to Estancia Maria Bajete for my annual hosted trip this January. This is a trip I look forward to every year, not only because it means I get to return to the Rio Grande, uh, which is a wonderful river, but also I get to see Buenos Aires and I get to spend time with clients. This is very special for me because I used to guide on the Rio Grande and it brings back a lot of great memories of my guiding days and also I get to see how techniques have developed on the river which they always do because it's quite a technical fishery. I met the group in Buenos Aires this year as we all had flights from different directions. Spending the first night there really it's a great opportunity for everyone to get to know each other and enjoy the best of Argentine food and hospitality. We were staying in Palermo, which is a great area in Buenos Aires, as is Recoleta. They're both close to each other, they've got fantastic places to stay, and they've got some of the best, certainly steak restaurants, you will find anywhere in the world. The schedule for the Aerolineas Argentinas flights changes each year. We always hope that you're going to be able to fly into Rio Grande at a sensible hour and then depart at a sensible hour. Unfortunately this year it wasn't the case. We had to fly into Rio Grande on Friday evening and we arrived very early on Saturday morning. This isn't an issue, I mean the flight takes three and a half hours and we were met when we arrived and we transferred to a local hotel, the Grande Hotel. At lunchtime the following day, we were picked up and transferred to Estancia Maria Bajete. This is really easy and it only takes 40 minutes. En route, we passed La Vigia, which is owned by the same Estancia. They often get confused. La Vigia takes six rods, Estancia Maria Bajete is slightly larger and takes 12 rods. Although La Vigia is located downstream, they fish the same water and they rotate through the same beats. So whether you're fishing one or the other, you still have access to some of the most fantastic water on one of the world's best sea trout rivers. On arriving at Estancia Maria Bajete, it was wonderful to see the same faces again. Mariana was there, Ropo was there, and Gennaro, the head guide, was also there. I think this season was almost, it might have been his 20th, so to say the guide team at EMV is experienced would be an understatement. On being met, we had a drink and then were quickly taken into the dining room to have a delicious lunch. This was an instant reminder just how exceptional the food is at EMV. Soon after, we got to tackle up and then we just prepared our kit for the week ahead. EMV is on the north bank of the Rio Grande and moves in rotation with the lodges on the south side of the river. They have access to a huge variety of fishing from the middle reaches of the river all the way down to the bottom. I always choose to set up two rods because of this. You can fish a single handed rod but my preference especially early in the season when we were fishing is to have two two handed rods. I like a 13 or a 13 and a half foot 7-8 or 8-9 weight, uh, one with a Skagit line and one with a Scandi line. What the guides tend to do is they will always approach the pool with the least aggressive tactic. So you'll start fishing the pool with a Scandi line, an intermediate tip and a long leader and often a small fly like a EMB nymph or green machine. If nothing happens on the first pass through, then on the second time around, we might try and fish a little bit deeper. And that is where Skagit line can be useful and you can cast heavier tips and heavier flies. A Skagit line is also really useful 
if it's a particularly windy day, which is not that uncommon in this part of the world. Reels, I use my salmon reels. They're perfect for this kind of sea trout fishing. A reel with a good drag that matches and weights the rod correctly is ideal. Make sure there's plenty of backing, because especially early in the season, the brighter fish can run, and sometimes on rare occasions you can hook a king salmon, and these certainly run. One thing to think about, or that's often not mentioned is, with running lines, is not to have one that's too thin. These very thin mono running lines are fantastic for a lot of our salmon fishing at home, but you will find if there's a windy day on the Rio Grande, they can be a nightmare because they will tie in a bird's nest in no time. So I actually prefer slightly thicker coated running lines for this type of fishing. With tips and leaders, I will have a range of poly leaders for the Scandi line from intermediate, slow sinking and fast sinking in 10 foot long. And then for the Skagit line, I'll have a range of tips from the lighter side of things to T8 through to 12 foot of T18. Although I don't really enjoy using 12 foot of T18, there are rare times that it can be the difference between landing fish and not. Leader material, I generally fish fluorocarbon on the Rio Grande. You can use Maxima Ultra Green, but the water is quite clear and when it's low, I do feel like fluorocarbon gives you the slight edge. I prefer not to fish too light. Even 15 pounds is erring on the side of too light for a lot of the fishing I do there. So I tend to stick mostly around 20 pounds fluorocarbon or 23 pounds. I often won't fish much heavier unless I'm fishing in the evening with big leeches and then stouter material like 25 pound fluorocarbon can be of benefit with these big flies, especially as fish aren't too leader shy when the light drops. Having set up all of our kit, then we had the rest of the day to relax, catch up on a little sleep and get ready for the week ahead. I spoke with the head guide Gennaro about the rotation, which works brilliantly at EMB. Once you're paired together, uh, the guiding works on a ratio of one guide to two rods. It's really fair at EMB. Gennaro will give you a hat, you pick your pairing out of the hat, and then that's your rotation for the week. You'll have different guides each day, and you'll rotate through all of the main beats that are fishing well during that week. The following day, I spent the morning with a couple of the team who hadn't done a lot of spay casting before. Although all of the guides have a huge amount of experience with both guiding and teaching all of the rods spay casting where necessary, especially when dealing with the wind. It was useful for me to be with a couple of the team. Then myself and Sebastian, the guide, could give one-on-one -on -one tuition with spay casting to the guys who hadn't done that much spay fishing before. This was really useful I think for them and to be honest that's kind of why I was there as a host just to help out where necessary. Being on the river again was is always wonderful. It's a really very special place especially if you like salmon and sea trout fishing. There's really nowhere like it. I enjoy fishing the whole of the season on the Rio Grande, but I especially enjoy the fishing early in the season in January. The reason why is I love catching some of the brightest and strongest fish of the season. At this time, especially earlier in January, you don't have the same numbers as you, as you might late in the season, but you're catching some of the best fish of the season. And when you hook into these, you can have some extraordinary fights. Funnily enough, the best fights are often not from the very biggest fish. The best fights are often from a fish that's 15 to 17 pounds in size and often a female. And these fish are bright, they're coin silver, they jump, they try and throw the hook, they tear off backing. 
the fight can just be pretty amazing. It's worth talking about the rest of the season also. I love fishing early in the season, but there's no bad time to fish the Rio Grande. It's just different. You tend to find that people consider the latter part of January and February often the prime season, and that's when you can catch good numbers of fish and good numbers of fresh fish. But this doesn't mean that later in the season the fishing is poor. The fishing can still be excellent. And you know that if you fish late in the season, there's lots of fish in the pools. It's just the trick is trying to tempt them. You often find that late in the season also is it's when you can catch some really big fish because those big males get really territorial. Usually early in the season when we were there in January, uh, you would expect quite high water. This time was not the case. There hadn't been as much snow in the Andes as there might have been normally in the winter. So the water was low and lower than I had seen it for quite a long time. We were also not hugely blessed with great weather conditions during the week, which was unfortunate. A lot of the days were very bright and very sunny. And especially when the water's low, the fish seem more susceptible to poor conditions than if the water was higher. This didn't mean that we had bad fishing though. Sometimes it was tough, but everyone throughout the week caught some stunning fish, especially once the light started to drop later in the day. And you will find, I always say to people during the week on the Rio Grande is, what often happens is you go through a tough patch of a session or a day where your partner's catching fish and you're not. But if you keep at it, everyone hits their golden patch. And throughout the week, you tend to find that everyone has had good fishing and it's fairly evenly spread. Whether you're fishing in January, early in the season, like we were, when generally the numbers of fish in the river aren't as high as they are late in the season, or you're fishing slightly later, most of the best pools have plenty of fish in. And you can find that even though you know the fish are there, it can be quite quiet. And what's strange and interesting about the river is you can return to the same pool when conditions are a little better or the light has dropped a little. And the pool that you thought was completely dead is now, it's got fish porpoising everywhere. And it's, a, it's almost like you're fishing a different river. And this is really, I mean, it's sea trout fishing for you. They are a notoriously moody fish. And you do find the Rio Grande that even though the river's stuffed full of fish, you just need the fish to be in the right mood. And when they are, you can have some of the most memorable sessions you're likely to have on any river in any part of the world. So throughout the week, the water was low. So we did have to be really stealthy with our approach to the pools. And as I mentioned earlier, you will find the guides at EMB, firstly, they've got a huge amount of experience. The junior guide there has been there five years and the senior guide has been, Gennaro has been there 20 years. They know, they really know what they're talking about and they're not remotely shy of imparting all of their knowledge and they really, really want to catch fish equally as much as the angler does. So we found that the stealthy approach was so important. So we'd approach a pool with really long leaders, scandy line, an intermediate tip, and fish it slow and fish it carefully. For me, when I fish a pool, especially if I know there's plenty of fish in it, is what I really want to know from the guide is where the hotspot is because some of these pools are quite long and I really want to know where the taking spot is. And that means in that taking spot, then I can concentrate on it a little more and fish it slightly slower rather than fishing the whole pool extremely slowly. And if I know there's fish there, especially if they're showing, I will constantly be thinking about changing the angle of a fly when I'm mending, changing the fly itself. And often these small little changes 
can really be the difference between good fishing and not. My, there's lots of ways to fish the river and there's no right or wrong way, but often my first approach is to try and keep my angle fairly shallow and fish the fly fairly slowly if I'm fishing small flies like nymphs or green machines. I find generally that um, a really square cast often doesn't fish quite as well as fishing the fly slightly slower. This isn't always the case though. The guides do have a lot of experience and although they're not going to be shy to tell you how they, how you should be fishing the pool, uh, it's really worth just making sure that you're doing exactly what they want because sometimes if you don't ask they will just assume. Ask technical questions like when you go to the pool ask where the best taking spot is, ask the angle and speed that you should be fishing, exactly how you should be stripping that fly and all of these little bits of information be really specific about how they want you to fish that pool because that will make a big difference to your success. Especially often when it comes to fishing with a Skagit line and fishing slightly deeper. How you, the angle you cast and how you mend when you're using heavier tips and heavier flies can have a huge impact on how deep you're actually fishing. Even if you're fishing 12 foot of T18, if you fish it in the wrong way, it might not fish that deep. So pick your guide's brains and really ask them exactly how you should be fishing that technique and how they want you to move through the pool. Although on the Rio Grande you're not really meant to fish or you're not allowed to fish when it gets dark, you will fish to dusk and the light will be failing. It's really worth kind of making sure you get an idea of the structure of the pool before you're struggling to see. And of course again ask your guide about how they want you to fish it. One thing to note is that obviously I always advise wearing sunglasses when you're fishing on the river at any time but it's really worth having a pair of clear safety glasses when the light's failing because then you're still protecting your eyes when you're casting these big leeches. It was great to introduce a group of rods to the Rio Grande this week because it really is a very, very special river and most had never been to Argentina before other than one. Yes, we all had periods of a week where the fishing was slightly more tricky and it wasn't sunny in the afternoon so the sun was shining downriver and in the fish's faces which is not conducive to great fishing. Everyone caught some stunning fish. It was great that they got to see what fishing in January and fishing the Rio Grande is all about. Most of the guys all caught fish of 15, 16 pounds and up and some bigger. In most places in the world that would be a fish of a lifetime. On this river that's a lovely fish but it's not a fish of a lifetime. It was great to return to the lodge each evening and just speak to everyone at the bar and find out who had the story from the session and the day. And there were always lots of stories. Some of the notable fish of the week were some cracking 15 pound fish, a lovely 16 pound fish. One of the chaps caught a 17 pound fish in really quite shallow water and quite far upstream, further upstream than where we thought the fish would be. And all of the party caught effectively a sea trout of a lifetime. And this was really wonderful to see. For anyone looking to fish the Rio Grande, Estancia Maria Bajete must be really high on the list. This is for, I mean, a number of reasons. Firstly, they control or have access to the widest variety of water on the river. And because of this, they're able to adapt according to the conditions best than anyone else. Early in the season, they've got access to the lower beats where the highest concentration of fish is. Late in the season, they also have access to the middle river where often there's a huge con concentration of fish. So not only are they able to adapt to the conditions really well, you also get to see 
a wide variety of pools on the river. So you really do get the whole Rio Grande experience because the pools further downstream are quite different from, from the pools on the middle river. Not only is the fishing fantastic, I've said it before, but the guide team are exceptional. I've been lucky to have guided in quite a few destinations and the team at EMB are some of the most experienced guides that I've seen anywhere in the world and they're really there to help and they really want to catch fish. The fishing is great, the guides are great, but when you return from your session, be it at lunchtime or at the end of the day, what's noticeable is that you come back to the lodge and it feels like returning home. They have got the balance between a fantastically comfortable fishing lodge and one that has exceptional food without being too flashy. It's just very comfortable. The food is exceptional, uh, especially if you like meat. It is Argentina. And the staff are extremely welcoming and friendly. If you're lucky, you might meet Ropo, who's the owner. It's been in the family a long time. It's a family-run operation. And returning there each year feels like returning home. I'm looking forward to, uh, in fact, can't wait to return to EMB next year. I hope this video was useful. As always, please like and subscribe to our channel.